Mr. President, thanks for having us here. Let us know, please, what's the situation in Syria now? What's the situation on the ground? What is happening in the country? If one talk about the Syrian society, the situation is much, much better as we learned so many lessons from this war. And I think the future uh, of Syria is promising as normally we're going to get uh, out stronger of this war. Uh, talking about the situation on the ground, uh, the Syrian army has been advancing for the last few years, uh, liberated uh, many areas from the terrorists, uh, still left Idlib where you have al-Nusra that's been supported by uh, the Turks, and you have the northern part of uh, Syria uh, where the Turks has invaded our territory uh, last month. So uh, regarding the political situation, you can say it's becoming much more complicated because you have much more player that's been involved in the Syrian conflict in order to make it a drag on and to turn it into a war of attrition. When, uh, when you speak about liberating, uh, we know that there is uh, a military vision uh, on that. But the point is, uh, how is the situation now for the people that decided to be back in society? The process of reconciliation now, mm. at what point is working or not? Yeah. Uh, actually, the, the methodology that we adopted when we wanted to, to create, let's say, a good atmosphere what we call this reconciliation, but for the people to live together and for those people who lived outside the control of the government areas to, to go back to the order of law and the institution, uh, it was to give amnesty to anyone. And he's going to give up his armament and uh, obey the order, let's say, and the law. Uh, the situation is not complicated regarding this uh, issue, as you can yeah, you may have the chance to visit any area, you'll see that the life is going back to its normality. The problem wasn't people fighting with each other. It wasn't the case like the Western narratives may try to show a Syrian uh, fighting with each other, or they call it civil war, which is uh, misleading. Uh, the situation was terrorists taking control of that area and implementing their rules. When you don't have those terrorists, people will go back to their normal life and live with each other. There was no sectarian war. There was no ethnical war. There was no political war. It was terrorists supported by the outside powers. They have money in armaments and they all occupy that area. Aren't you afraid that this kind of ideology that took place and uh, you know, was the basis of everyday life for people for so many years, in some ways can stay into society and sooner or later will be back. Yeah, this is one of the main challenges that we've been facing. You're asking about is very correct. You have two, two problems. Those areas after the control of the government were ruled by two things. Uh, chaos, because there's no law, so the people, especially the young generations, know nothing about state and law and institution. The second thing, uh, which is deeply rooted in the mind, the ideology, the dark ideology, the Wahhabi ideology, ISIS or al-Nusra or al sham or whatever kind of these Islamist, terrorist, extremist ideologies. Now we started dealing with this reality because when you uh, liberate an area, you have to solve this problem, otherwise you, what would the meaning of liberating? Uh, the first part of the solution is religious because this ideology is religious ideology. And the Syrian uh, religious clerics, or let's say the religious institution in Syria, is, laying, is making a very strong effort in that regard. And they succeeded. They succeeded as, uh, let's say, uh, helping those people understanding the real religion, not the religion that they've been taught by al-Nusra or ISIS or, or, or other factions. So basically clerics and mosques are part of exactly. this reconciliation process. This is the most important part. The second part is the schools. Schools, you have uh, teachers, you have education, uh, and you have uh, the, uh, the national uh, curriculum. And this curriculum is very important to change the mind of those uh, young generations. Uh, third, you have the culture. You have the role of the arts, uh, uh, intellectuals, so on. In some areas, it's still difficult to, to play that role. So it was much easier for us to start with the religion, second with the schools. 
But Mr. President, let me just go back to politics for an instant. Uh, you mentioned Turkey, okay? Uh, Russia has been uh, your best ally these years. It's not, it's not a secret. Yeah. But uh, now Russia is compromising with Turkey on some areas that are part of Syrian area. So yeah. how, how you, you assess this? To understand the Russian role, we have to understand the Russian principles. For Russia, they believe that the international law and the international order based on that law is for their interest as Russia and for the interest of everybody in that world. So for them, supporting Syria is supporting the international law. This one point. The second point, being again the terrorist, again, is in the interest of the Russian people and the rest of the world. So uh, being with Turkey, the, making this compromise doesn't mean they support the Turkish invasion, but they wanted to play a role in order to convince the Turks that you have to leave Syria. They are playing a role in the same way. They're not supporting the Turks. They don't say, oh, well, this is good reality, we accept it, and Syria must accept. No, they don't. But because of the American negative role and the Western negative role regarding Turkey and the Kurds, the Russian step in in order to balance that role, to make the situation, let's say, I wouldn't say now better, but less, less bad, if you want to be more precise. So in the meantime, that's their role. In the future, their uh, position is very clear. Syrian integrity and Syrian sovereignty. Syrian integrity and sovereignty is in contradiction with the Turkish invasion. That's very obvious and clear. So you're telling me that uh, the Russians could compromise, uh, but uh, Syria is not going to compromise with Turkey. I mean, the no, relation is still quite no, no, tense. No, no, even the Russians didn't make compromise regarding the sovereignty. No, they deal with the reality. Now you have bad reality. You have to be involved to make some, I wouldn't say compromise, because it's not the final solution. It could be compromise regarding the short-term situation. But in the long term, or maybe in the midterm, the, uh, uh, Turkey should, uh, should leave. There's no question about it. And in the long term, any plan of discussion between you and Mr. Erdogan? I wouldn't uh, feel proud if I have to, someday. And I wouldn't feel, uh, I would feel uh, disgusted to deal with uh, uh, those kind of uh, opportunistic Islamists. Not Muslim, Islamists is another term. It's a political term. Uh, but again, I always say, uh, my job is not to, to be happy with that I'm, what, what I'm doing or, or not happy or whatever. It's not about my feeling. It's about the interest of Syria. So wherever our interests go, I will go. In this moment, when Europe looks at Syria, apart from the consideration about the country, there are two major issues. One is refugee and the other one is uh, jihadis or foreign fighters yeah. coming back to Europe. How do you say this uh, European uh, war is? We have to, to start with the simple question. Who created this problem? Why do you have refugees in Europe? The simple question, because of terrorism that's been supported by Europe. And of course, the United States and Turkey and others. But Europe was the main player in creating chaos in Syria. So uh, what goes around comes around. Europe. Why do you say it was the main player? Because they publicly supported, the EU supported the terrorists in Syria for the, from day one, or let's say from week one, whatever, from the very beginning. They blamed the Syrian government and some regimes, like the French regime, sent uh, armament. They said one of their officials, I think their Minister of Foreign Affairs, maybe Fabio said, we sent, they sent uh, armament. They created this chaos. That's why. A lot of people find it difficult to stay in Syria. Millions of people couldn't live here. They had to leave to, to get out of Syria. In, the mo in this moment in the region, uh, there are turmoils and there is a certain chaos. One of uh, uh, other allies of Syria is Iran and the situation there is getting complicated. Mm -hmm. Does it have any reflect on the situation in Syria? Definitely. Whenever you have chaos, it's going to be bad for everyone. Is going to have side effects and repercussions, uh, uh, especially when there's external interference. If it's a spontaneous, if uh, you talk about demonstrations and people asking for uh, reform or for a better situation economically or any other rights, that's positive. But when it's for vandalism 
and destroying and killing and uh, interfering from the outside power, now it's definitely uh, nothing but negative, nothing but bad and danger on, on everyone in this region. Are you uh, worried about what's happening in Lebanon, which is really the real neighbors? Yeah, in the, in the same way. Of course, uh, Lebanon would affect Syria more than any other country because they are our direct neighbors. But again, uh, if it's spontaneous and it's about the reform and about, about getting rid of sectarian system, political system, that would be good for Lebanon. Again, that depends on the awareness of the Lebanese people in order not to allow anyone from the outside to try to manipulate the spontaneous uh, movement or, uh, or uh, demonstrations in Lebanon. Let's go back to, to what's happening in Syria. In uh, June, Pope Francis wrote you a letter asking you to uh, pay attention and to respect the population, especially in Idlib, where the situation is still very tense because there are fightings there. And uh, uh, when it comes even to the way prisoners are treated in jails. Uh, did you answer to him and what did you answer? The letter of the Pope was about his worry about the civilians in Syria. And I had the impression that uh, maybe the picture in the Vatican is not complete. And that's expected as the mainstream narrative in the West is about this bad government killing the good people. And as you see and as you hear in the same media that every bullet of the Syrian army and every bomb only kills civilians and only hospitals. They don't kill terrorists as they select those civilians, which is not uh, correct. Uh, so I, rep uh, I responded with a letter explaining to the Pope the reality of Syria, as we are the most to be concerned about, uh, or the first to be concerned about the uh, civilian uh, lives, uh, because you cannot liberate area while the people are against you. You cannot talk about liberation while the civilians are against you, or the society. The most crucial part in liberating any area militarily is to have the support of the public in that area or in the region in Jordan. That's what uh, was uh, been playing for the last nine years. So that's against our interest. But that kind of call, in some ways, made you also think again about the importance of protecting civilians and people of your country. No, this is something we think about every day. Uh, not only as moral and principle and values, um, as interest. As I just mentioned, without this support, without public support, you cannot achieve anything. You cannot advance politically, militarily, economically, in every uh, aspect. We couldn't withstand this war for nine years without the public support. And you cannot have public support while you're killing civilians. This is equation. This is equation. This is self-evident equation. Nobody can refute it. So that's why I said, regardless of this letter, that's, this is our concern. But again, the Vatican is a, is a state, and we think that the role of any state, if you have worry about those civilians, to go to the main reason. The main reason is the Western role in supporting the terrorists is uh, the sanction on the Syrian people that made the situation much worse, and this is another reason for the refugees that you have in Europe now. How you don't want refugees at the same time you create or the situation or the atmosphere that will tell them go outside Syria somewhere else and of course they'll go to, to Europe. So this state or any state should deal with their reasons and we hope the Vatican can play that role within Europe and within the world uh, to convince many states that you should stop meddling within the Syrian issue, stop uh, uh, breaching the international law. That's enough. We only need people to follow the international law. The civilian will be safe, the order will be back, everything will be fine, nothing else. Mr. President, uh, you've been accused several times of using chemical weapons, and this has been uh, the, uh, the instrument of many decisions and the key points, the red lines for many decisions. Uh, one year ago, more than one year ago, there has been the Duma event. Yeah. Uh, that has been considered another red line. After that, there has been bombings, uh, uh, and uh, it could have been even worse. 
but something stopped. These days, through WikiLeaks, it's coming out that uh, something wrong in the report could have taken place. Exactly. So nobody is still able to say what has happened, but something wrong in reporting what has happened could have taken place. Since the beginning of this war, since the beginning of this narrative regarding the chemical weapons, we said we didn't use. We cannot use. It's impossible to be used in our situation for many reasons. Let's say logistical reasons. For Give moral. me one. One reason, very simple one, when you're advancing, why do you use chemical weapons? You're advancing, we are advancing. Why do we need to use it? We are in, we are in, a, better, in, in a very good situation, why to use it? Especially in 2018, this is one reason. Second, very, very concrete uh, evidence that refute this narrative. When you use chemical weapons, this is mass destruction weapon. You talk about thousands of dead, or at least hundreds. That never happened, never. You only have these uh, videos of a staged uh, chemical weapons attack where uh, uh, the recent report that you've mentioned, the recent leaks, there's a mismatch between what we saw on the video and what they saw as technicians, uh, as experts. Uh, the amount of chlorine that they've been talking about, first of all, chlorine is not mass destruction uh, material, first of all. Second, the amount that they found is the same amount that you can have it in your house because, you know, it exists in many of the households uh, that you want to use maybe for cleaning and whatever. The same amount exactly. That's what the OPCW organization did. They faked and falsified the, uh, the report just because the American wanted them to do so. So, fortunately, this report proved that everything we say during the last few years, since 2013, is correct. We were right, they were wrong. This is a proof, this is a concrete proof regarding uh, uh, this uh, issue. So, again, the OPCW is being biased, is being politicized, is being immoral, and those organizations should work in parallel with the United Nations to create more stability around the world, they've been used as American arms and Western arms to create more chaos. Mr. President, after nine years of war, uh, you, you were speaking about the mistakes of the others. I would like you to speak about your own mistakes, mm. if any. Uh, is there something you would have done in a different way and uh, which is the lesson learned that can help your country? Definitely, for when you talk about uh, doing anything, you always find mistakes. This is human nature. But when you talk about political, uh, uh, let's say, practice, you have two things. You have strategies or big decisions, and you have tactics, or let's say, in that context, I mean the implementation. Uh, so our strategic decision, or main decisions, were to stand against the terrorism, and to make reconciliation, and to stand against the external meddling in our affair. And till today, in, after nine years, we still adopt the same policy. We are more adhered to this policy. If we think it was wrong, we would have changed it. And actually, no, we don't think there was anything wrong in this. We did our mission. We, 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 we implemented the Constitution in protecting the people. Now, if you talk about mistakes in implementing, of course, you have so many mistakes. But I think if you want to talk about the mistakes regarding this war, we shouldn't talk about the decisions taken during the war, because the war, part of it, is a result of something before. Two things we faced during this war. The first one is the extremism. The extremism started in this region in the late 60s and accelerated in the 80s, especially the Wahhabi ideology. If I want, if I want to talk about mistakes dealing with this issue, yeah, I would say we are very tolerant of something very dangerous. This is a big mistake. We committed during decades. I'm talking about different governments, including myself before this war. Uh, the second one, when you have people are ready to revolt against the order, to destroy public properties, to commit vandalism, and, uh, and so on, uh, they come against their country. They are ready to go and work for foreign powers, foreign intelligence, uh, uh, ask for external military interference against their country, this is another question. 
How did we have those? Uh, they asked me how. I'll tell you, before the war, we had more than 50,000 outlaws that weren't captured by the police, for example. And for those outlaws, their natural enemy is the government, because they don't go to prison. And how about also the economic situation? Because part of it, yeah. I don't know if it was a big or a small part of it, but mm. part of it has been also the discontent and the problems of population in certain areas in which economy is not working. Yeah. Is it a lesson learned somewhere? It could be a factor, but definitely not the main factor. Because if uh, some people talk about four years of a drought that pushed the people to leave their uh, land and the uh, rural area to go to the city, it could be a problem, but this is not the main problem. They talk about the liberal policy. We didn't come, we didn't have liberal policy. We're still socialists, we still have public sector, very big public sector in government. You cannot talk about liberal policy while you have big public sector. Uh, we had growth, good growth. Of course, in the implementation of our policy, again, you have mistakes. How can you create equal opportunities? between the people, between the rural area and between the cities. When you open the economy somehow, the cities will benefit more. That will create more immigration from the rural area to the city. These are factors, could be, could play some role, but this is not the issue, because in the rural areas where you have more poverty, the money of the Qatari play more uh, actual role than in the cities. That's natural. You pay them for one week what they can do in half an hour. That's very good for them. We are, we are almost there, but there are two more questions that I don't want to ask you. One is about reconstruction, yeah. and uh, uh, reconstruction is going to be very costly. Yeah. How can you imagine to afford this reconstruction? Who could be your allies in reconstruction? Yeah. We don't have a big problem with that. Talking that Syria have no money now. Actually, the Syrians have a lot of money. The Syrian personnel everywhere in this world, they have a lot of money, and they wanted to come and build the country, because when you talk about building the country, it's not giving money to the, to the people. It's about getting benefit. It's a, it's, a, it's a business. So many, not only Syrians, wanted to do business in Syria. So talking about where you can have fund for this reconstruction, we already have. But the problem that this sanction prevent those businessmen or uh, companies from coming and working in Syria. In spite of that, we started, in spite of that, some foreign companies started finding a way to evade uh, this uh, uh, sanction, and we started planning. Uh, it's going to be slow, but without this sanction, we don't have problem about funding. Ending on a very personal note, Mr. President, do you feel like a survivor? Uh, if you want to talk about national war like this, where every, nearly every city has been harmed by terrorism or external uh, bombardment or anything like this, uh, you can talk about the Syrians as survivors. Uh, but again, I think this is human nature to be survived. You, and you yourself? I'm part of those Syrians. I cannot be disconnected from them. I, I have the same feeling. Uh, again, it's not about being a strong person who's a survivor. Uh, if you don't have this atmosphere, this society, uh, this incubator, let's say, to survive, you cannot survive. It's collective. It's not, uh, it's not a single person, it's not one man show. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thanks for you.